in the heart of Yosemite National Park's majestic wilderness, where granite cliffs touch the sky and ancient sequoias stand as silent witnesses, a gruesome series of deaths occurred, which shattered the tranquility of this natural haven. In what was previously a respite from reality, these murders, which occurred in 1999, have stained the park's pristine beauty ever since. Eventually, authorities were able to track down a man whose family had already been involved in one notorious crime, and whose last name was about to be associated with yet another national tragedy. On February 12, 1999, Carol Sund, 42, her daughter, Julie, 15, and her daughter's friend, Silviana Peloso, 16, left their home in Eureka, California to go on vacation in Yosemite National Park. After first flying to San Francisco, where Carol rented a red 1999 Pontiac Grand Prix, they stopped in Stockton, where Julie took part in a cheerleading competition at the University of the Pacific. On February 14th, the three drove to Cedar Lodge in El Portal, located off of Highway 140, on the western side of Yosemite Park. There, they got a room with the plan to stay for a few days. Carol and her husband, Jens, 43, owned a realtor business in the Stockton area. Jens could not accompany the three on their excursion, as he needed to prepare for an upcoming business trip. On February 15th, the ladies hiked into Yosemite National Park on one of its many trails. That evening, the group borrowed some movies from the lodge's service desk in order to watch them in their room. This would be the last time the women were ever seen alive. The lodge staff asserted that during the room cleaning the next day, they found no signs of foul play, nor anything raising suspicion. Checkout procedures had been completed by the party earlier, and the room keys were left on the desk. Jens had planned to rendezvous with the three at the San Francisco airport that evening en route to Arizona. The plan was for Jens to attend his work meeting while the women explored the wonders of the Grand Canyon. Jens remembers how surprised he was when he did not find his wife at the airport. He assumed she had been confused by their plans and had flown ahead. However, the next day, when he tried to contact them again and failed, he called the police. The rental car company confirmed that Carol had never returned the Pontiac, nor had she told them that they were extending their agreement. Local police and Yosemite park rangers began to search the area where the missing three were last seen. The initial suspicion was that they may have wandered off the main hiking path and got lost in the park. For four weeks, police, family, and volunteers searched the area in and around Yosemite National Park by helicopter, by foot, and by skis. Rescuers were informed to be on the lookout for the missing red 1999 Pontiac Grand Prix or any of the women. Then, Carol's wallet turned up in Modesto, California, which included her money and credit cards. Modesto was located over 100 miles away from Yosemite by car. This unexpected discovery caused detectives to shift away from the missing hiker theory and onto something far more sinister. Because of the discovery of Carol's wallet in suburban Modesto, police and the FBI searched the logical routes in and out of that area, interviewing homeowners, business owners, and anyone who may have seen them. On February 28th, the Bureau relocated its temporary headquarters from Yosemite to Modesto and made a statement that it was no longer treating the Sund incident as a missing persons case, but that of a murder. More than a thousand leads poured in. Various people confessed, yet still, it produced nothing. The Bureau intensified its search, recruiting more high-tech equipment as well as air support. Unofficially, Carol's husband offered the general public a $250,000 reward for information that would lead to the return of the missing woman. After a couple weeks, he upped the sum to $300,000, but it was to no avail. Carol's parents, Francis and Carol Carrington, appeared on the Good Morning America TV show to ask for the prayers of the public and to ask for their help in locating their daughter and the children. The other sunned children believed their mother and sister Julie would eventually be returned, but by the middle of March, their hopes had faded. On March 18th, just over one month after the trio went missing, 
The Sun's family's worst fears were confirmed when a hiker wandered onto the site of a burned out red 1999 Pontiac. The rental car was found intentionally hidden in a secluded area of the Stanislaus Forest region in California, roughly 100 yards north of Highway 108 near Long Barn. The California Highway Patrol verified the car's license plate as that of Carol's vehicle and immediately notified the FBI. The following day, March 19th, agents arrived in order to open up the car trunk. Upon opening up the trunk, investigators found two charred bodies. Near the crime site, police found a camera. Upon developing the pictures, they found photos of Carol, Julie, and Sylvina that they had taken during their Yosemite visit. Police found one photo which they determined was the last image ever captured of the woman while they were still alive. It had been taken just 20 minutes before their murder. After several days using dental records, the bodies found were positively identified as Carol Sund and Sylvina Peloso. One week later, a note was sent to the police with a hand-drawn map indicating the location of the third woman who had been missing, Julie. The top of the note read, quote, we had fun with this one. Investigators went to the location depicted on the map, and on March 25th, Julie Sun's body was discovered near Lake Pedro in Tuolumne County, located a nearly 90-minute drive from where the bodies of her mother and friend had been found. She was severely decomposed, and her throat had been cut. Over the next few weeks, a task force, which included FBI agents and law enforcement from four surrounding counties, questioned several known sex offenders, drug users, and ex-convicts with a record of violence from within a 75-square-mile area between the cities of Modesto and Sonoma. The police reckoned that the killer of the three women was someone familiar with the county, given the location of the woman's car, as the vehicle was hidden off a spur road, which locals had previously used to dump old appliances. By mid-April, four men were considered the main suspects in the initial inquiries of the murders. They were ordered to testify before a grand jury in Fresno, California. By the end of June, the FBI had reviewed their testimonies and the evidence that linked the suspects. At that time, the Bureau stated that while no one had been charged, they felt that those responsible for the killings were already behind bars. The four longtime criminals that were initially arrested for the crime were part of a vagabond group of methamphetamine drug users and their friends centered in the Modesto area. Michael Mick Larwick, 42, of Modesto, had grown up in Tuolumne County, near where the bodies of Carol Sund and Sylvina Peloso were found. He was originally arrested and jailed on March 16th after allegedly shooting a Modesto police officer. He had a long criminal record and had been questioned extensively by the FBI. He, however, denied any role in the Yosemite slings. His half-brother, Eugene Rufus Dykes, 32, also of Modesto, was arrested alongside him. Billy Joe Strange, 39, and El Porto Parolee, who had worked at the Cedar Lodge Lounge and Restaurant, where the murdered women were last seen, was arrested on March 5th, when he allegedly reported to his parole officer with liquor on his breath. The FBI pushed for Strange's arrest, but he too denied any part in the triple homicide. The fourth person to be arrested was Daryl Gray Stevens, 55. He was Strange's roommate. Convicted in 1978 for and robbery, he was later jailed for failing to register as a sex offender. However, while they were arrested, none of the four were ever formally charged for the killings. There was one more man who was questioned and later arrested. His name was Kerry Stainer. He'd worked at the Cedar Lodge as a handyman. He had no criminal record, and his only previous encounters with law enforcement was for marijuana use back in 1997. He was soon released into the general public with no charges brought against him. Then, in the summer of 1999, when tourists and locals alike flocked to the breathtaking peaks and valleys of Yosemite and its surrounding towns, there was another murder. Acting on a tip from a caller who was worried about the whereabouts of his friend, Joy Ruth Armstrong, 26, park rangers found her decapitated body the morning of July 22nd. 
The body was discovered beyond a campground adjacent to Joy's living quarters in the Foresta community, a group of 30 cabins for use by park workers. Her body was next to a stream, with her head submerged in the very water that she and her friends had used for drinking. Joy had been working for the Yosemite Institute for the past year. She had worked on education programs through a partnership with the National Park Service. Detectives say she had probably been murdered on the evening of Wednesday, July 21st. She was seen that day at the Institute offices and was planning to visit a friend in Sausalito. However, she never made it. When she did not appear as scheduled, her would-be host had phoned the park. Police found her car in front of her cabin, already packed for the trip. The main suspect for the second murder was a familiar face to those involved in the investigation, 37-year-old Carrie Stainer. He had been one of the people questioned after the triple killings in February. At the time, no evidence had linked him directly to the crime, and he had been released. Because he was the handyman at Cedar Lodge in El Portal, where the women had stayed before they were murdered, his questioning at that time seemed to be more routine than anything else. However, this time, FBI agents detained him and forced him to answer questions about the current murder. Investigators searched his truck and confiscated his backpack for examination. With no concrete evidence located, he was released. However, the FBI warned him not to leave El Portal. Police had found car tire marks and footprints outside of Joy's cabin. A witness also remembered a distinct blue with white stripe International Harvester Scout on the road where Joy's cabin was located. Detectives soon realized that the vehicle had matched the description of Carrie Stainer's vehicle. Another witness recalls how after being questioned, Stainer was furious that authorities had taken his backpack. He was also angry that his truck had been searched. Stainer's apartment was searched later in the day and authorities discovered evidence that concretely linked him to Joy's murder. By Friday, July 23rd, Stainer had disappeared from the area. When agents came to arrest him, they instead located him at the Laguna del Sol nudist colony, which he frequently visited. Its manager had seen a story on television and had recognized Stainer's photo as one of his guests. He promptly notified the FBI and agents descended on the colony, returning Stainer to El Portal on Saturday, where he was put through a more lengthy interrogation. On the way to his police interview, Stainer confessed to a detective in the car that he had murdered Joy Armstrong. He described the killing, quote, as if he was reading a soup label, recalls John Boyles, an FBI agent on the case. Soon after, Stainer confessed to murdering Carol, Julie, and Sylvina. Stainer said to investigators, quote, I want you to get a hold of some producers in Los Angeles. I want a movie of the week made about my story. Many believe that in this request, he was recalling the fanfare regarding his brother's prior perilous experience. Steven Stainer was seven years old and in the second grade when he was abducted in 1972. On December 4th, in what would become a story of international proportions, Carrie's little brother, Stephen, was walking home from school when a man named Irvin Edward Murphy stopped him. He asked if Stephen's mother would be interested in donating to a church. When Stephen said yes, Murphy then asked him where he lived and if he would be willing to take Murphy to his home. After the boy agreed, a white Buick, driven by Kenneth Parnell, a convicted offender pulled up and the boy climbed into the car with Murphy. Parnell then drove the confused boy to his cabin in nearby Kathy's Valley. Stephen later recalled, quote, they passed the road that I lived on and they said that we'll just call your parents to see if you can stay the night. The kidnapper, Kenneth Parnell, then proceeded to manipulate the young boy, lying to Stephen that he had gone to court and had, quote, gotten possession of him. Parnell mal- Stephen the first night at the cabin and began assaulting him 13 days later on December 17, 1972. A week into his abduction, Stephen was ordered to call Parnell dad and was told that he now had a new name, Dennis Parnell. At the beginning, he sort of like brainwashed me to believe that my parents didn't want me. 
Stephen says that he was, quote, always scared of Parnell, which is why he never told anyone about the molestation or the rape. For seven years, Stephen and Parnell presented themselves as father and son. Stephen would be under what some experts would classify as Stockholm Syndrome, going along with the ruse out of fear and manipulation. As Dennis, Stephen was enrolled in schools, including one in Point Arena, California, which was only a five-hour drive from his hometown. Meanwhile, his family tried to keep his disappearance in the news in hopes of getting more information. Stephen said that Parnell would eventually go on to sexually assault him 700 times. Parnell boasts that the actual number was far higher. As Stephen got older and entered puberty, Parnell began to look for a younger victim. Parnell offered drugs and money to Stephen's friend Randall, and on February 14, 1980, they abducted Timmy White. However, Stephen knew that he could not allow Timmy to suffer as he had. And in 1980, while Parnell was away at his security job, Stephen took Timmy and ran. They hitchhiked back to Ukiah, but unable to find Timmy's home address, Stephen instead took him to the police, becoming an overnight hero. Parnell was eventually arrested and convicted of kidnapping. However, prosecutors chose not to charge Parnell with any of the assaults of Stephen, believing that they were protecting Stephen during a time when there was a stigma against male sexual abuse. Parnell was sentenced to just seven years in prison, serving only five. Randall and Murphy, Parnell's accomplices, were each convicted on lesser charges. In 2004, Parnell was convicted and sentenced to 24 years for attempting to abduct another young boy. Parnell died in prison in 2008. As details of the sexual abuse came out in the media and at Parnell's trial, Stephen was bullied at school, called names and slurs for gay men, which further victimized him. However, despite his highly traumatic childhood, Stephen persevered and eventually married in 1985 when he was 20, later having two children, Ashley and Stephen Jr. Then, towards the end of the 1980s, Hollywood and the Stainers came to a deal regarding the film rights of Stephen's tragedy. The made-for-TV movie, entitled I Know My Real Name Is Stephen, aired in two parts on May 22nd and May 23rd in 1989. Actor Corin Nemec starred as Stephen, and the real Stephen even had a cameo as a police officer. Family members recall he was happy with the film and that audiences liked it too. Nearly 40 million viewers tuned in, making it NBC's highest rated miniseries in five years. I Know My First Name Is Stephen was nominated for four Emmy Awards, but the night before the ceremony, Stephen was riding his motorcycle home when he was fatally struck by a car. He was only 24 when he met his untimely death. Because there was a TV movie made about his brother, the request made by Carrie Stainer years later illustrated he wanted the same type of fame and for the world to take notice of him. By the end of their questioning, the FBI felt they had gathered enough evidence to arrest Carrie Stainer for murder. On Sunday morning, they rushed him to Fresno to officially lodge a complaint, and then to Sacramento on Monday, where he was put before the courts. That same day, Stainer allowed himself to be interviewed by a reporter from KNTV. During the session, an unexpected event occurred. In a voice that seemed relieved to be unburdened, Stainer yelled, quote, I am guilty. I did murder Carol Sund, Julie Sund, Sylvina Peloso, and Joy Armstrong. Later in the interview, he also insisted that none of the women were sexually abused in any way, a point with which the prosecution takes umbrage. In the televised interview, Stainer said he had fantasized about killing women for the last 30 years. He describes in detail how he murdered each one of them. He said he had strangled Sylvina and Carol in their rented cabin in the Cedar Lodge Motel. He then detailed that he took Julie to a lake where he killed her early the following day. Stainer said that while he thought he'd gotten away with his earlier crimes, he could not resist the urge to kill Armstrong after he struck up a chance conversation with her. Concluding the interview, he addressed the victim's families, saying, quote, I'm sorry their loved ones were where they were when they were. I wish I could have controlled myself and not done what I did. FBI sources claimed that Stainer had already confessed his guilt during the Saturday evening interrogation. In the Bureau's perspective, this time they certainly had the right man. 
He had given the FBI details that only the killer would have known in such specificity that the agents were able to recover evidence confirming his confession. It was confirmed that knives were used in the slayings and the weapon suspected in Joy Armstrong's death was eventually recovered. According to Special Agent Christopher Hopkins, both the FBI's evidence response team and the Mariposa County Sheriff's Office collected items of potential interest from room 509 at the Cedar Lodge Motel, the room in which Stainer assaulted Julie and Sylvina, later murdering them both. In his interview, Stainer claimed that hair from his body was left on the bedspread in their motel room, but that he later returned and changed the bed. In his interview, Stainer claimed that hair from his body had been left on the bedspread in their motel room, but that he later returned and changed the bed. The FBI laboratory found hairs and vacuum sweepings taken from room 509 and bodily fluid stains on a blanket. They also found a palm print on the windowsill, which matched Stainer's. Stainer claims he bound Joy with duct tape, which later was found and had hair evidence. Agents seized clothing stained with blood from the body, and although most of the stains were likely to include Armstrong's blood, Stainer was observed to have a laceration on his hand, and therefore may have been cut and bled during the attack. Fingerprints were also lifted from the interior of Joy Armstrong's truck. A motel handyman recalled that Stainer's only passions seemed to be nude sunbathing and hiking. On days off, he would escape to Laguna del Sol, a nudist colony in Sacramento County. The Cedar Lodge had hired Stainer as a handyman in 1997, two years before the murders. They gave him the use of a small apartment on the top floor. Management says they found him to be a hard worker and honest. In his capacity, Stainer performed technical and housekeeping duties, from fixing electrical and mechanical breakdowns to delivering extra towels and bedding directly to guests' rooms. Those who worked with him recall he usually ate lunch and dinner at the motel restaurant. However, he never made any close friends. At the age of three, Stainer received a diagnosis of trichotillomania, a condition characterized by compulsive hair pulling, often resulting in noticeable bald patches. Despite being prescribed medication, the impact of the trichotillomania persisted throughout Stainer's high school years. This led to severe bullying due to the visible bald spots, forcing him to constantly wear a baseball cap. His struggle with this condition, coupled with his brother's abduction, is believed to have influenced his later reported sexually deviant behavior. Carey later said that when Stephen went missing, he felt neglected while his parents grieved. When Stephen escaped and returned home, he received massive media attention, and Stainer says he felt overshadowed by the attention his brother got. The FBI was initially reluctant to point solely to Stainer as the only killer because they and many others did not believe that he acted by himself. Given the brazen killing of the three women in the Cedar Lodge Motel and the disposal of the bodies, many residents were convinced that not one person could have created so much horror. As Letty Carolyn Berry, the owner of the Yosemite Rosebud Lodge, which is just west of Cedar Lodge, said of the community response that the logistics of the crime indicated there had to be more than one person involved. Privately, some members of the Sund and Peloso task force were saying the same things to the media, ruminating that it was difficult for some investigators to believe that Stainer alone could have gotten the jump on all three women without any help, let alone have disposed of their bodies. The trial was moved from Mariposa County to Santa Clara County in favor of finding jury members who were not locals. Locals might have had intimate knowledge of the victims and therefore possibly could have their vote swayed by emotion. In May of 2002, Stainer pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to the 1999 triple murders. On July 22, 2002, the court heard Stainer's taped confession, which he had given to FBI agents. On July 22, 2002, the court heard Stainer's taped confession from questioning with FBI agents. In this, he calmly admits to the agents questioning him that he had talked his way into room 509 under the guise of fixing a leak and had pulled out a gun. I knocked out the door, said I was maintenance. I had a leak in the room upstairs. They let me in. Uh, I knocked out the door, said I was maintenance. I had a leak in the room upstairs. They let me in. He herded Julie and Sylvina to the bathroom and tied up Carol and then strangled her to death. He put her body in the trunk of the Pontiac and pulled Sylvina and Julie from the bathroom. 
been sexually assaulting them. Sylvina started to resist, so he took her to the bathroom and strangled her to death. He then put Sylvina's body in the trunk of the Pontiac and forced Julie into the car. I put her in the car. I just drove. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was going to do. He recalls how he carried Julie to a lookout point near Lake Don Pedro, where he claims he pledged his love to her and then cut her throat just as the sun rose. I put Julie on the car. I carried her down the pathway. And I laid out the blanket. And I guess I knew what I was going to do was I had the knife with me. He recalls that he abandoned the group's rental car with the bodies of Carol and Sylvina inside, returning two days later to burn the evidence and to retrieve the wallet, which he later dumped in Modesto to confuse authorities. The issue being argued was no longer who committed the murders, but whether Stainer was insane at the time, and whether the confession the FBI agents received was coerced. Stainer, clad in a red jail jumpsuit, bowed his head throughout the trial, but showed no emotion. Stainer was already serving his life sentence for the murder of Joy Ruth Armstrong, the hiker who he killed in the summer of 99. After sustained questioning by the FBI, he had eventually admitted his guilt and said that the day Joy disappeared, he was driving his car to Foresta, where he saw the young woman. She was packing her car as she prepared for a trip. And I was just over there throwing rocks in the creek and just got the nurse and walked out again and again. It seemed like she was alone. I had a backpack, a small green backpack. In the backpack, I uh, had a 22 revolver. I just went pulled out the gun and put it to her head. She turned around and freaked out. I told her to go inside. He admitted that he held Joy at gunpoint in her own cabin as he bound her with duct tape and then forced her into his car. She resisted quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear or anything. I just used threats and the gun to subdue her. As I was trying to duct tape her hands behind her back, she kept fighting me. And as I was driving, she started going crazy, just jumping all over the place in the back of the truck. I couldn't really control her. And she fell off through the window on the road right in front of the barn. I slammed her truck in the park and jumped out. She got up off the ground and started running. I took the knife from my back pocket and I slipped the road. Then dumping her into a stream. Stainer's defense lawyer argued such a confession was under duress and therefore inadmissible. The issue of whether his confession was coerced was resolved, however, when on July 24th, the court heard recorded demands that Stainer made to the FBI agents personally. He said that he wanted these demands to be satisfied before he would give them his confession. Stainer demanded that his parents be given the reward money and that he be incarcerated at a prison near his parents' home. He also insisted that he be given a large cache of CSAM. Previously, his defense maintained that the FBI had coerced the confession, but such demands indicated otherwise. In the end, Stainer confessed without the promise of the illegal media nor the reward money for his parents. Stainer was tried in federal court for Joy's murder as it had occurred on federal land. To avoid a possible death sentence, he pleaded guilty to premeditated first murder, felony first degree murder, kidnapping resulting in death, and attempted aggravated sexual abuse resulting in death. During the sentence hearing, Stainer stunned the courtroom when he suddenly broke down in tears and apologized, saying, quote, I wish I could take it back, but I can't. I wish I could tell you why I did such a thing, but I don't even know myself. I'm so sorry. I wish there was a reason, but there isn't. It's senseless. Leslie Armstrong, Joy's mother, began crying as she listened to Stainer and said afterward that she believed his apology was genuine. Stainer also admitted that he had intended to murder two other Finnish girls in 1998, but fled when the girl's school advisor arrived. His lawyers claimed that the Stainer family had a history of sex abuse and mental illness, manifesting itself not only in the murders, but also in Stainer's obsessive compulsive disorder and in his request to be provided with such images in return for his confession. Dr. Jose Arturo Silva testified that Stainer had obsessive compulsive disorder, mild autism, and paraphilia. Paraphilia is the experience of recurring or intense sexual arousal due to atypical objects, situations, 
fantasies, behaviors, or individuals. Paraphilia has also been defined as a sexual interest in anything other than a consenting human partner. Stainer pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity to the other three murders in state court. On August 27, 2002, Stainer was found sane and convicted of three counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances and one count of kidnapping. He was sentenced to death. At the closing of the case, the judge said there was overwhelming evidence against Stainer and that the devastating emotional toll justified a death sentence. Later, it was uncovered that in 1999, there was almost another double murder under Stainer's belt, as a woman who had been dating him, along with her two daughters, were almost killed on Valentine's Day. I don't want to see it. Her daughters were my original intended victims. However, his attempt was foiled when other people were at the house. I got back to the motel late. I was going so in the hot tub, trying to calm down. In the hot tub, was dirty. So I was a little annoyed, so I took a walk around the property. That's when he saw Carol, Julie, and Sylvina. Uh, I walked, there was a red car, the 500 building all by itself. The window was open, the curtain was open, and I can see inside that there's two young women and my young man. Stainer was also suspected, but never convicted, of up to five other murders to which he has connections. These potential victims include 28-year-old Patricia Marie Hicks Dalstorm, also known as Patty, who last contacted her family in September of 1982 after relocating to Merced from Washington State. She had joined a religious following, the San Anda Apostolic Church, founded by cult leader Donald Gibson. Patty later decided to leave the cult and was last seen by her roommate taking public transportation to the Yosemite National Park. Ten months after she was last seen, a severed arm and a hand were recovered from Yosemite on June 28, 1983. In 1988, a skull was also discovered near the original crime scene. In April of 2021, genetic genealogy identified the remains as being those of Patty's. The connection made between the victim and Stainer lies in their mutual relationship to the cult leader. Stainer attended and supported Gibson at the time of his 1981 trial, and authorities believe Stainer may have chosen to kill Patty in retaliation for her prior testimony against Gibson. On December 26, 1990, Stainer's paternal uncle, 42-year-old Jesse Gerald Stainer, also known as Jerry, with whom Carrie lived with in Merced, was shot to death in his home with his own shotgun. The murder was never solved, and Stainer later became a suspect. Stainer later claimed that his uncle molested him around the same time that his brother Stephen was kidnapped, when Stainer was just 11. In October of 1994, severed human hands were found near the new Malonis River. On December 13, 1994, a headless and handless torso was found in a cluster of trees off of Camp Nine Road near Vallecito, California, by a group of boys who were burning yard debris. A forensic pathologist determined that the detached hands belonged to the same person. In December of 1995, the remains were identified as belonging to 24-year-old Sherilyn Mavone Murphy. Her head has never been found. The FBI investigated Murphy's homicide to determine a link between Stainer and her due to similarities between her death and the murder of Joy, although no concrete evidence was ever recovered connecting Stainer to the murders. Authorities also reviewed the case of 34-year-old Denise Smith as possibly being connected to Stainer. Denise's decomposed body was discovered in a 50-gallon burn barrel off of Jacksonville Road near Don Pedro Reservoir in December of 1994. 20-year-old Michael Larry Madden, also known as Mike, had planned to meet his friends at Sandbar Flat Campground in the Stanislaus National Forest near Sonora, California, on August 10, 1996. He was intending on staying to camp and fish. That day, he left his family's home around 5 a.m. and was never seen again. At 2 a.m. on August 12, 1996, Madden's companion showed up to the predetermined spot but found no sign of him. Authorities have considered that Madden may have also been a victim of Stainer, as his killing field of choice, Yosemite National Park, was located just 75 miles east of Sonora. After being sentenced to death for the brutal killings, Stainer has been housed at the Adjustment Center on death row at San Quentin State Prison in California. Stainer has remained on death row since 2002, as there have been no executions in California since a 2006 court ruling. 
Yosemite's pristine landscape, now scarred by unspeakable horror, is as resilient as the native people who once occupied the land. The rugged backcountry trails now teems with tourists, and few asked would be able to speak on the lives intentionally taken on those same trails by Carrie Stainer. But the memories of those lost live on in the minds of their friends and families. If you like what we do and want to see more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much to our patrons. If you would like to support this channel, you can visit the link in our bio below.